My name's uh, Martin Kaplan from the Royal Free Hospital in uh, London, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be co-chairing this session with uh, Daniel Halperin from ND uh, Anderson in, uh, in Texas. Um, this session is on improving uh, radiotheranostics, and uh, as you'll be aware, and as clinicians, it's possibly been the most exciting area of development in, in, in the last 10 years. We have the establishment of PRRT uh, programs uh, around the world, which have clearly benefited uh, patients. But the question is, how do we move on from uh, what has been fantastic advances with, for example, uh, lutetium uh, dotatate uh, of PRRT? How do we make that even better? How do we improve the, the imaging, the sensitivity of the imaging? How do we prove, improve the, the therapy uh, aspect uh, of it as well, looking towards the future with the new alpha therapies, looking at antagonists and, and their improved binding and uh, potential for, for increasing uh, tumor um, uh, eff efficacy and treating the tumors. And so, um, that's really the basis of this session, which is going to be looking at uh, some new imaging uh, modality, uh, modalities and also looking at how can we uh, improve enhancement of uh, the binding of uh, peptides to, uh, to receptors and understand that, that, uh, that process. So it is with great pleasure that I'll hand over to Daniel to do the first uh, introduction and uh, we'll kick on. Ah, uh, yes, that'll work much better. Thanks very much. Uh, just working out all the kinks. Uh, so, of course, also very happy to co-chair this session. Of course, radiotheranostics, a very hot topic in our field. And so we'll start off uh, with Dr. Guillaume Nicholas from uh, the University Hospital Basel, who's going to present about copper PET with copper 61 Nodaga LM3 for detection of neuroendocrine tumors. Thanks very much, Dr. Nicholas. Thank you very much. Dear Chairman, thank you. Uh, that's a great pleasure for me to be here today, and uh, very thankful for the Net Research Foundation to be uh, funding this uh, project. Uh, it's a collaborative project, of course. Uh, I'm here on behalf of my co-workers, especially Professor Fanny from my university at uh, University Hospital in Basel, Switzerland. Um, it's also together with uh, the Technical uh, University at Munich and uh, our industrial partner, Nucleidium. Uh, so when we first um, designed this project, uh, the idea was uh, how to make it better, how to provide the patient a better tracer with improved uh, uh, clinical performance, but also to make it more available. So um, we set up a project which is divided in two years. Uh, the first year we are just right now at the end of it is to first establish production for human use of copper 61 in two centers, one in Basel, uh, one in, in Zurich, sorry, which is an hour away from Basel, um, and one in Munich, which is five hours across the border, and to see if uh, such a model is working for central production and shipment of copper 61 to peripheral center. And the second part is the first uh, translational aspect of this work, to make a pilot study on eight uh, neuroendocrine tumor patients with bronchial net or uh, gastroenteropancreatic net, so as you know, we are in November, so um, we are not exactly there where we should be probably, but we are confident to um, uh, have this one month delay catched up very rapidly to take us a little bit more time to establish copper 61 production in these two centers and to conduct the clinical study on time for next year. So I won't be able to present uh, our uh, clinical data so far, which is going to be next uh, symposium, hopefully in 2024. But we are ready with the submission. We are waiting for approval and start our first patient quarter one next year. So why did we choose copper 61? I think this is one of the main questions. Uh, we wanted to increase or improve image quality. And we know that the positron energy is inversely correlated to the spatial resolution. So the higher the energy of this um, positron, the higher the better, the, the, the worse um, spatial resolution it is. And you can see it is on this phantom measurement with gallium 68 having a quite high positron energy, you reach a better spatial resolution and image quality 
when using Copper 61. The second aspect of it to improve further image quality is to use maybe later time point imaging. We know that with the compounds we have so far, maybe the best time point for imaging may not be one hour. At least with the antagonist that we will use in this project, maybe best time point for imaging between three and four hours. And the other thing is to make it more available. We wanted a uh, an isotope that is readily scalable. As you know, gallium-68 is a uh, generator produced isotope. Um, Copper-61 is a cyclotron production that can be easily scalable. So we start with a uh, solid target. It is nickel-61, which is electroplated uh, on a coin that can be inserted uh, in the cyclotron. After 15 minutes of proton uh, beam on that uh, nickel coin, you obtain copper 61, which is then the hot coin that needs dissolution. So it's a solid target, needs dissolution. Um, this is done with a concentrated chloric acid. Then you need purification step and once you pass the first quality control, you can ship the solution copper chloride, copper 61 chloride to the peripheric center, which is in our case, uh, the University Hospital Basel. At the uh, GMP facility, we can then perform the radio labeling. For the uh, copper uh, or nickel 61 that is not used, you can recycle it to make the next plate. So why, the next question is why somatostatin receptor antagonist. We have now a body of evidence preclinically, but also clinically that um, somatostatin receptor antagonist may be beneficial, at least in terms of imaging. We have more binding sites for, for the antagonist on the receptor, and therefore higher tumor uptake. Also, uh, surprisingly from uh, preclinical data, but we found in, in clinical setting that uh, um, ant antagonists have also a favorable biodistribution with lower background activity into the liver, and this is a work that is now uh, quite old, um, where we showed in a head-to-head -head comparison increased sensitivity of the gallium label Nodaga GR11, which is um, an antagonist over gallium dotatoc, because essentially liver metastases were much better depicted. Uh, this has been also confirmed by others in uh, China, the group from uh, Dr. Tzu, shown as well in comparison head-to-head to, -head to gallium dodatate, uh, confirmed the uh, beneficial uh, background, lower background in the liver and higher activity in the tumor, so better sensitivity. Preclinically so far with copper 61, we have data in mice where uh, one aspect of it is the choice of the chelator. Um, the chelator nodaga is not dota. Why not dota? Because copper may be um, uh, going out of the complex, uh, may, may get decomplexated. That means that it can be released of the chelator and land into the liver, which is then detrimental in terms of uh, image quality. Also using Doda Nodaga, which is more stable over time, you gain uh, tumor uptake and lower background so that you gain in tumor to background ratio. Here looking at the um, first mouse, you're about 7% of injected activity per gram while here you are at about 9 to 10%. If you compare it further, uh, the agonist done with Nodaga talk, which is the same mass here, but for the purpose of um, the imaging, we change the scale. Um, the uh, use of the antagonist this time is even more beneficial. So we have good reason to proceed further in the clinic with this type of data. Um, one more aspect is which time point should be better. Is it one hour? Is it four hours post-injection? We know that with the four hours, we have a further improvement of the tumor to background ratio. So this also should be translated in improved diagnostic efficacy. And you would tell me, well, why don't you use copper 64? This is already FDA approved. And you can also use copper 64, which has a longer half-life of 12 hours to make delayed imaging. Well, beside the discussion on the chelator, here is DOTA chelated compound, which may not be so um, practical for later time point because of the release of copper in, in, from the chelator and then accumulation into the liver. 
you notice that using LM3, which is in green, the bar chart, all the tumor to background ratio are favorable for the antagonist. So we are at the end of the first year. We have achieved uh, in two centers the production uh, of copper 61 in two cyclotrons in Munich and in Zurich. We are expecting approval very soon for starting beginning of next year the first patient and complete the first eight patients. This study will be looking at safety, of course, and the pharmacokinetics, biodistribution, and dosimetry. And we um, are very grateful as well for the Net Research Foundation grant because with that, we will be able to expand to a phase one, two randomized controlled trial in an extended cohort of 27 patients. So this study, which is actually grafted on the first uh, phase zero one study, um, is doing a comparison head to head in the same patient of copper nodaga LM3, which is the antagonist, in a randomized control crossover order with either calcium dodatox, PET CT first or after, as we want to avoid any um, bias effect from the sequence. So we placed either the calcium dodatox before or after the antagonist. We will look at imaging at one hour, at three hour, and at 18 hour for those um, patients who are um, undergoing dosimetry analysis. We will compare the data of all scans with the follow-up imaging as standard of truth. Optional would be also in some um, difficult cases, maybe access to some biopsy um, for analyzing the sensitivity. So we will include um, all patients with well-differentiated bronchopulmonary net or gastroenteropancreatic net all grade with a ki 67 less than 50%. Those patients would be referred for gallium dodatoc, which is clinically indicated as a standard of care. Patients with um, at least two lesions detected on previous gallium dodatoc scan would be recruited. For those who have a negative gallium dodatoc scan, we will request a positive net test. In patients with tr treated with somatostatin analog, the time interval between the last injection and both scans should be kept constant. This is to avoid any change in biodistribution. The uh, exclusion criteria are very well standard. So we will study safety, of course, the adverse event, the potential uh, drug reaction, the vital sign, and laboratory parameters as a primary outcome, co-primary outcome for which we have um, uh, made a sample size calculation based on previous literature, is the sensitivity of copper nodaga LM3 at one and three hours, so that we can also know what is the best time point for imaging in comparison head-to-head -head in the same patients with gallium dototoc. As secondary outcomes, we will look at the positive predictive value of copper nodaga LM3 in comparison with gallium dototoc. Again, we'll look at the biodistribution, pharmacokinetic, and dosimetry. Um, we will look at the optimal imaging time point, and with that, we will integrate Patient's preference also, because we know that later time point may be critical when asking the patient what he would prefer. So maybe this would be also interesting to look at. And at explanatory end point, we want to probably also know what is the impact on management, which I haven't listed here, the optimal injected activity, the tumor detection rate, and the predictive value of Kappa Nodaga LM3 PET CT for PRT response. So with that, I would like to thank my uh, co-workers at University Hospital in Basel, especially Professor Fanny, Dr. Manuel Alejandro Lafont, who did the hard work in validating batch uh, production, Dr. Andreas Baumann, um, Professor Wild, my colleague Alin Kirendel, Felix Kaul, and Nikki Romers from the Biostatistics for provi pro 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 providing the um, sample size calculation, sorry. Um, our industrial partner, Nucleidium, and uh, um, the, the two um, production sites, at the cyclotron site at uh, TUM and at uh, USZ. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any question. We should have time for, for one question, I think, before moving on to the next topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Baudet. No question? Okay. Thank you. Ah, sorry. Hi, Gil. Oh, Lisa, good morning. Hi. 
Ni very nice uh, presentation and data. Uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate uh, a little bit more the choice of the comparison, the head-to-head -head comparison of uh, Copper 61 uh, Noraga LM3 with the gallium data talk. I understand, obviously, the comparison with the standard of care, but why not introducing a comparison with another copper um, to demonstrate the um, better efficiency of imaging with copper 61, for example, as opposed to copper 64? Maybe a, a more tricky challenger that you are right. I think from a theoretical point of view, we, we didn't want to address these questions yet. Uh, that may come later also with F18 label compound, which I think it's actually even more interesting. Um, for one aspect, copper 64 for me is not the appropriate comparator. Um, we are um, having a, an isotope that has a lower positron uh, fraction, has a little bit of a significant amount of beta minus, and so the, the, the dissymmetry might not be, might not be the, the perfect one, and the, the compound that copper 64 is now available is not available in Switzerland as such, but the DOTA um, conjugated copper 64. Um, may not be the most uh, appropriate one. So I think this is the, the, the answer to this question so far. But we don't have it available in Basel anyway. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're going to move on. So we've just briefly reviewed uh, antagonists and the higher binding. We're now moving on to a fascinating area of using statins to enhance dotatate binding and efficacy in SSTR to low uh, tumors. And uh, it's a problem we often have in choosing patients for, for PRRT. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Patricia Pereira from uh, Washington uh, University uh, School of Medicine. Thank you. All right, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today talking about some of our preliminary work on trying to modulate SCSTR2 protein levels to enhance data date uptake with a focus on SCSTR2 low tumors. I have no disclosures. So my lab, uh, it's one of the things we're very interested in, is in understanding how receptor dynamics, membrane dynamics affect uh, uh, drug del delivery. And this is because receptors are not always available at the surface for drugs to bind to them because they get internalized through an endocytic process where they can be degraded or they can recycle back to the cell surface. This is very important in the context, context of uh, therapeutics uh, here an example with, with antibodies, because if these receptors are not on the surface, then the antibody won't be able to bind to them. And in the, in the last years, I've uh, been showing that by using cholesterol depleting drugs as statins, we can uh, mo uh, modulate receptors on the surface. We can increase their levels at the surface in a temporary and a reversible way. And uh, we thought this strategy was very interesting from a pharmacologic point of view because uh, uh, statins are used all over the world, patients that they are being treated for, for cancer therapeutics. Uh, sometimes they are taking statins because of the high cholesterol levels. And so in the past, here just an example in the context of the human epidermal growth re receptor 2, these are tumors collected from a saline or a statin cohort. And we show that on, on saline, uh, the HER2 expression is, is diffuse, is not uh, homogeneous on the surface. And on statin cohorts, we can see uh, these homogeneous patterns, so showing that they can increase membrane receptor density. We show that by, by using statins, we can increase accumulation of antibodies such as anti-HER2, uh, antibody trastuzumab to tumors. Here at the bottom, more of the red signal at the tumor site on statin cohorts compared with saline cohorts. And we also show that by combining uh, statins with anti HER2 antibodies such as trastuzumab or trastuzumab drug conjugates, TDM1, TDXT, or uh, trastuzumab-based uh, uh, radioimmunotherapy uh, labeled with lutetium-177, we can improve uh, a therapeutic response. So uh, trying to apply some of these uh, approaches and knowledge that we, we had in the context of HER2, we wanted to move forward and apply our studies in the context of neuroendocrine uh, tumors, and I don't need to tell this audience why we need to uh, improve the therapies. These are tumors with a, a high uh, incidence rate. 
And in, the, in this context, we have a receptor, the somatostein receptor 2, which is a G-protein couplet receptor. In this context, as you know, we have dotate. It's a somatostein analog. It's a, a, an agonist, and it targets SCSTR2 in these tumors. Uh, this microcycling here, it's, uh, it's great. We can have this uh, uh, chemical uh, being used as both an imaging or a therapeutic agent, so we can use uh, copper 64, for example, to label that microcycle and use it for PET imaging. Here's just an example of a PET image. Or we can switch it to lutetium 177 and have it as a therapeutic. So the way it works is that dotate binds these SCSTR2 receptors on the surface, so we need, uh, we, we need them expressed on the cell. Uh, they will be then internalized, and then the beta particle from lutetium will induce the DNA damage, which, which results in cell death. So now if you look here, this process starts up here, where we really need the uh, expression of SCSTR2 for this to be effective. And... Uh, this is important because just an example here on SCSTR2 high tumors based on IHC, there was a good a signal on PET-CT, but on SCSTR2 low tumors, the signal, it's, uh, it's very low due to uh, low uptake. Uh, this uh, receptor is very heterogeneous in expression. Here's just an example. Uh, so clones uh, one are more homogeneous for expression, while two are very low, and that results in a clone uh, clone one having more absorbed dose uh, to them compared with number two. So, uh, in in the context of uh, these tumors, the low expressors are, are usually refractory to target therapies. And also for the high-grade uh, tumors, they are often associated with a loss of SCSTR2 expression. So we really wanted to test whether or not we could use uh, uh, our uh, approach using statins to elevate uh, uh, cell surface SCSTR2 in tumors. Here's just an example uh, on uh, IMR32 cell lines, which are uh, express SCSTR2. On Western blot, we could see an upregulation of uh, uh, SCSTR2 at the cell surface without major changes in total uh, protein levels, and here quantified on the left. Uh, that resulted in an increase in binding for dotate. This is dotate labeled with copper 64. Uh, we saw uh, an increase in binding in uh, statin-treated cells for both the high cell line, but also now including a low cell line, FTC133, we saw this increase in binding, and we were pretty excited, and we wanted to move on with our study uh, in uh, the FTCs, uh, FTCs133 uh, SSTR2 low cells. We validated this further using immunofluorescence analysis. Here, just an example, three cell lines from top to bottom, higher expression to lower expression. Uh, seen in green for SCSTR2. When we incubate these cells with statin, we can see an increase in, in signal uh, for uh, both the IMR, but higher for the, FT, for the SCSTR2 low cancer cells. And so this was very promising. So we moved ahead with a couple of uh, uh, animal studies. And so this is pilot data in uh, the FTC 123 model. We were trying to understand if uh, the statin dose, the way it's given, could influence the uptake. And so we tried the two X, uh, a two doses schedule where the statin was given uh, the day before and at the same time uh, as dotatate, uh, labeled with copper 64. And in a one X where the statin was given after uh, dotatate uh, uh, injection. And what we saw was that on both cases, there was uh, an, uh, an increase in dotatate binding uh, to, to this tumor. So now remember, these are low expressors, so we have this uh, background accumulation as well because the tumors have low levels of SCSTR2. But even though we can see that the statins can increase uh, dotative accumulation in these uh, low expressors. These are some uh, representative uh, PET images. Here on the left, uh, PET images for saline uh, showing low uptake. While the statin cohorts, we are able to show more uh, uptake for dotatate. And a good, uh, one thing to highlight is how heterogeneous this uptake is, even with the statins, we can see some of these red hot spots uh, in the tumor. Uh, we, we performed uh, dosimetry studies. Uh, so the goal now is to uh, move forward with therapy by switching copper 64 to lutetium 177 dotatate. 
In our dosimetry, we can see that we can we increase uh, uh, to, uh, absorb dose to the tumor in the statin cohorts. Interestingly, we decrease up uh, absorb dose in in adrenals. But again, as I said, this is a low tumor, and we still have this. Um, macron accumulation that we're now trying to, to fix by using, uh, by testing different um, administrations for the statin and different uh, mouse models. And so in conclusion, I hope I was able to convince you that uh, um, PET imaging allows us to monitor uh, receptor uh, densities, but in this context, SCSTR2, uh, we can use pharmacologic approaches using drugs that they are already FDA approved, such as statins to modulate receptor density. Uh, and they can be a potential adjuvant when uh, combined with the peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. This approach is temporary and it's reversible, and so that end up becomes a trick in terms of defining doses and time points for the combination so we can translate these uh, results to, to patients. And so I would like to uh, give a special uh, acknowledgement to uh, Sheila Shmuel. Uh, some of you might have met her yesterday while she was at her poster. So she's been the one really uh, leading this project. Our, uh, together with the postdoc in the lab, Christina, a radiochemist, our collaborators, Dr. Ritual for the translation, Dr. Carter for help with the dosimetry, and Dr. Ryan Fields for uh, some of the NETS PDX that we are now expanding to test uh, our approach. Uh, the funding agencies, in, in particularly the NetRF uh, Foundation. And uh, thank you. And with that, we'll take any questions. Well done. We've got a few minutes for uh, questions. So um, please, uh, Leo. Thank you for this uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I was wondering, um, looking at your uh, few slides, um, it was not very clear to me whether uh, physiological uptake is influenced by the statin treatment. So uh, I have two questions. Have you been able to look for differences in tumor cells and, for example, normal cells in terms of the effect of statins in vitro? And um, uh, could you comment a little bit more on changes in physiological uptake? Because you would expect not a real selectivity uh, in the direction of the tumor in the announcement of the uptake? Yeah, so those are great questions. So statins have these pleiotropic effects, right? So we don't know what's the specific biological mechanism that's happening here. Uh, in terms of changes in other, um, the normal organs, this is very pilot. So we see changes in the absorbed dose for, uh, we actually see a drop in the uptake for dotate in adrenals, which we're not, sure why this is happening. Uh, in terms of increasing uptake for for other organs, we, we, we see a slight increase in uh, uh, liver, but it's not statistically significant. Now, in yeah, the but I mean, for example, in the pancreas, uh, where you would expect uh, the spleen mm -hmm. uh, specific uptake. Yes, we didn't see major changes. Now, in my previous work, we, uh, I looked at changes in endothelial cells in, in, in mice, but those were therapeutic cohorts of, with the antibodies that we we're testing. And we do see changes in, in terms of endothelial cells when we give the statins. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Tita. Yeah, so I had a similar question, and you sort of answered it also. But you were talking about uptake. Are you measuring uptake or are you measuring binding? Mm -hmm. They're two different things. Mm -hmm. What is the data that it's getting internalized mm -hmm. that you have? So for, uh, you were asking the contact for do the take, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh -huh. So the measure is person ID per gram. So, uh, and we do this over time. We do see a washout. We do see this washout of dotate from the tumor. The statin does not prevent the washout. We do see an increase, especially at four hours after injection. But over time, we do see this washout, which is a little slower in the statin cohorts. But the the statin is not preventing that washout. I don't know if that answered the question. In terms of binding, we did a, we did a lot of uh, uh, studies in previous work for HER2, where we uh, measured Bmax values, KD values. We do see an increase in, uh, in, in binding and a decrease in dissociation. For SSTR2, is very pilot at this stage. Okay. Lisa, I'm, I'm, is it very, very quick very, one? Very quick. Go very on, quick. very quick. 
Um, just wanted to ask you, <clears throat> did you test uh, the binding and the uptake of just copper duratate or other analogs, particularly the ones that will be used for therapy, which is the ultimate goal, as mm -hmm. affinity may change a little bit with a mm -hmm. change of a steric change of a different <laughs> uh, isotope? That's a really good question. We we did the binding studies with copper 64 duratate, not yet with lutetium, no. And we do see um, an increase in binding, especially in membrane bound duratate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks. I'm actually going to take this opportunity to invite Dr. Pereira uh, and Dr. Nicholas to come have a seat on the podium so we can transition directly into the, the Q&A and discussion at the end. We'll take this opportunity with the technical difficulties to start any additional discussion about the prior two talks while you guys sort that out. Great idea. Dr. Pereira, hello. So I, just to follow on whilst we've got some minutes for discussion is um, there are different forms of statins. Obviously, there's lipophilic versus the uh, hydrophilic statins. So you've got resuvastatin, which is hydrophilic. You've got atorvastatin, simvastatin, lipophilic. Is there a difference then, and which sort of statins are patients taking, and how are you looking into that? That's a really good question. I'm laughing because we were collecting some data, and we don't know like what's... Uh, so anyways, uh, this is with the HER2 and TDXT uh, data that I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you about. Uh, so TDXT is this new trastuzumab drug conjugate that everyone is really excited about. It works in HER2 high, HER2 low tumors. And uh, following our work with lovastatin, so the statin I showed in my slides is lovastatin is the one we have been using. It's a prod drug. Um, compare, uh, and we we have seen this lovastatin improves uh, uptake, improves efficacy. Now with rosovastatin combined with TDXD, we actually uh, see a decrease in TDXD efficacy. And we do not. It, this is in preclinical models. Now we did retrospective data for patients treated with. Uh, Trastuzumab, and we try to stratify by statin use. We do see a trend where the the pro drugs seem to be seem to have a better effect compared with these newer statins. But the the number of patients was not uh, high enough for statistical power. But yeah, we do see a difference with the 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 pro drugs, the oldest statins uh, being better. Yeah. Um, I was I was wondering for all of you, what's the uh, what do you think this, the, the the PRT should go now? It should change the payload, maybe better with alpha therapy, or change the vectors to target SSTR low tumors. What where both. would you put your efforts in if you had to choose? I think both, because um, I think at the moment we don't know if uh, one is the driver of uh, the innovation or the other one or both at the same time. I think it's uh, valuable to try and optimize both. We are in our study looking at this both aspect for PET imaging, but I think for PRT would be the same to have uh, improved vector, but also more appropriate isotopes. And do you want to comment on alpha therapies then just at this time as well? Well, there would, has been incredible data uh, from uh, the Del Passon group. So of course we are uh, very excited about this uh, alpha therapy with lead to 12. Um, now, actinium also, uh, 225 is another alpha emitter that um, has been attempted uh, with very interesting results. So uh, we need more and larger trial to see uh, and confirm this data, and especially also uh, in comparison to uh, standard of care treatment. But um, I think this is very uh, fascinating uh, era that is opening. With the antagonists, we have to see. We just now published um, uh, phase one, two, uh, in the European Journal, uh, Nuclear Medi Medicine Journal uh, this year. Um, there is a very interesting activity shown here, um, whether a combination with another isotope than lutetium would be even better. This needs to be uh, um, explored. So real quick, I trained at WashU. Malincourt was huge when I was there. I can only imagine it's even bigger. There must be thousands of patients who have gotten a gallium dotatate scan, including hundreds that have gotten a negative gallium dotatate scan. All you need is an industrious fellow to look up who was on statins and who wasn't, and you're probably going to get great clinical data out of it. 
And then you were talking about how long do we treat? I mean, patients take these drugs for decades. And you could have somebody get a negative one, start on the drug, come back three months later and see what happens. Why not? No, no, that's, you know, I think those are like the next steps. We did look retrospectively for the trastuzumab patients taking statin, not dotate yet, but definitely that's, uh, um, um, you know, I think the preliminary data we're collecting is pretty exciting. And we, we have been looking to assess tier 2 low tumors, but maybe even the high tumors, if we combine them with the statins, we will improve uh, efficacy. Uh, so we're really looking forward to, to those next steps. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we still work our way through uh, through the technical issues. Um, Dr. Nicholas, can I toss one over to you? So I was I was struck, actually, by the by the design of the study, uh, and uh, as I often am, uh, and and particularly the co primary endpoints and looking at the comparison between the two scans. Can you talk to us a little bit more about how you're going to decide whether the study is is positive and and how you'll know that this is better or worse um, with one scan versus the other? So we, um, we look at the sensitivity. Um, sensitivity um, is, uh, we have powered the study uh, for, the, for that. Um, we are based on our assumption from previous study with Nodaga GR11, so the one that has been published with uh, gallium-68 labeled um, compound. Um, and with this, um, we are hoping for superiority uh, with a very limited number of patients. Um, but of course, we, um, even with 13 or 15 patients, um, the uh, cohort could be uh, adjudicated positive. Uh, if, if we have um, a non-inferiority design, um, assuming a 10% difference in sensitivity, I think um, the, uh, the, the, the trial could be positive with 27, 30 patients. So this is quite an ambitious um, setting, but of course, it's a phase one, two. And uh, it's not a phase two, three that's not ready for uh, approval. Yeah, that, that's why I asked, right? Because the bar has to be pretty high for the separation for a small study. That was the curiosity. Correct. Um, additional questions from the group, as I think we're almost ready. Oh, are we ready? We're right, 100% ready. Sorry about that. We'll now, we'll now have take two. But I do have one question. One, I do have one further question. This, it's a very interesting area in terms of enhancing the binding to, to the receptor. And you may be aware of the Lentara study, which is um, looking at ASTX, um, which is a demeth um, uh, demethylating uh, agent. And do you want to make a comment on that uh, methodology? And I think this is an intriguing way forward to uh, upregulate receptors. Yes, I'm, I'm familiar with the, uh, I think it's also, an interesting approach, right? I mean, uh, um, I think one of the advantages with the statins is we already know their safety profiles. Patients are already taking them. So from, um, I think from a translational perspective, combining them with, uh, with, with drugs, it's um, knowing the safety of the combination and when to combine. But one of the tricky things is to define when to modulate these things. Do we modulate before? giving these drugs while these drugs are being administered. Um, and PET can help with that because we can just titrate the system with, with the modulator and then use PET to optimize the dose. But I think that's the most, one of the most difficult parts is really to define the dose and the time points for, for this to be translated. Thank you. I think we may I? All right, let's go. All right, so thanks very much for the opportunity uh, to speak today. So we all know that lutetium-177 dotate has uh, uh, um, been used in the United States since 2019. It works quite well in, for uh, metastatic uh, neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, one of the things that my lab specifically is looking at is uh, how can we enhance that uh, therapy. And if we look at the data that's been out there, and I don't know if most of the clinicians here in the room would agree with this, but it appears that uh, PNETs uh, have a higher response rate when it comes to uh, lutetium-177 dotatate. So my lab uh, over the last couple of years and partially funded by the NetRF as well has, has, um, has looked into this and, and uh, we came out uh, with this idea that uh, MEN1 uh, actually does um, uh, play a really important role in DNA repair uh, capabilities. And this is, uh, um, uh, 
just a small little graph. We just looked at about 30 patients, and I don't know if you guys can uh, look at it in your cohort, but we at least uh, are seeing that uh, from a, um, a clinical perspective, uh, like patients with uh, MENWAM, DAX, and ATRX mutation also actually uh, tend to have a worse uh, progression uh, free uh, um, uh, survival. So um, what we do is pretty basic actually. Um, we look at uh, how DNA damages, um, excuse me, how radiation damages uh, DNA. Once you have DNA damage that accumulates, normally tumor cells, whether well it's regular cells, use two pathways. They use a lot more, but actually the two most, most common pathways for DNA double strand break are homologous recombination and non-homologous uh, end joining. If we can um, inhibit uh, DNA repair specifically in tumor cell, then DNA damage um, um, accumulates and patients uh, die. Uh, well, not patients, tumor cells die, excuse me. So when we talk about how we can improve PRT, there's many ways to look at this, and some of them have been uh, presented here. Some at certain um, upregulation is certainly one of the things, but what, what we focus at um, on specifically is DNA damaging um, agents uh, that can be uh, co-administrated with uh, PRT or uh, targeting um, associated pathways which uh, play an important role in DNA repair in neuroendocrine tumor cells, and this is specifically what I'm going to talk to you about today. So why, why are we studying um, estrogen receptor alpha and uh, PIN1, um, and why does that make sense in DNA damage repair? Well, we, we just, I just showed you very briefly before, and you can read the paper if you'd like, that MEN1 plays an important role in the transcription of homologous recombination gene. There has been some literature suggesting that um, estrogen receptor um, alpha also plays an important role in transcription of um, homologous recombination genes. This has specifically uh, been shown for uh, breast cancer. We all know that fulvestrin is an um, antagonist to um, estrogen receptor um, alpha, and that's been used quite commonly for breast cancer. Um, and then PIN1 is sort of this um, master phosphorylating um, enzyme that is uh, really, really important uh, and is, uh, uh, phosphorylates a whole bunch of things uh, in uh, normal cells as well as in tumor cells, including BRCA1. And ATRA is a uh, retinoic um, acid uh, derivative that um, um, inhibits uh, PIN1. So there's, in addition to uh, some data in breast cancer suggesting that um, ATRA through PIN1 um, inhibits phosphorylation of BRCA1 and therefore uh, DNA repair, uh, there's also more data suggesting that PIN1 actually um, induces a conformational change of the um, estrogen receptor, uh, which uh, then um, uh, leads to a change in uh, transcription of a whole bunch of genes, perhaps also homologous recombination genes. So the aim of our studies was sort of to see if we can combine these two pathways together and see if that makes sense in neuroendocrine tumor cells. So first of all, we studied, and I don't think this has been done before, but, but we sort of wanted to see whether uh, the cells that we have in the lab, so BON1, QGP1, as well as GOT1 and um, NCI uh, H727, are um, estrogen uh, responsive, and we did some flow cyto uh, uh, cytometry here, and you see that uh, proliferation actually does increase when you give them E2. Uh, that's true also for the GOT1 and um, NCI um, H727 cells. Um, importantly, also, when we grew these cells in um, estrogen-free media, we, we could show that uh, RAD51, BRCA1, and BRCA2 transcription uh, were actually downregulated, and that could be rescued when we added E2 back to the media. So there definitely is something there uh, that led us to believe that um, estrogen plays an important role in the transcription of uh, DNA uh, repair genes. And then on the lower bottom uh, right here, you could see that um, similarly, if we uh, knock down um, ESR1, uh, we actually uh, uh, decrease RAT51, BRCA1, and BRCA2 uh, messenger RNA levels. We also, when we knock down um, ESR1, make these cells more radiosensitive. So if we give them uh, four grays uh, in QGP1 cells, you can see here that compared to uh, radiation alone, uh, there's a significant drop in uh, proliferation. And similarly, uh, like we observe this uh, when we give ourselves fulvestrin um, in vitro. Now, we are fortunate enough to work actually with Novartis, who's providing us lutethera on a regular basis. And when we looked at uh, two types of cells, 
So one is a, the sort of the standard QGP1 cell line, which doesn't have a lot of somatostatin receptors, and then a transfected cell line, which uh, we got from uh, Charité in Berlin. Um, we actually uh, could see that if you add fulvestrant uh, to the uh, somatostatin receptor to transfected cell line, and we've done all the tests, by the way, regarding the binding and, and, and the um, absorption of the Lutetium-177 before that, I'm not going to show you that, but we, we sh showed that combining that with uh, fulvestrin, at least in a clonogenic assay, at, at 5.6 and 14.6 uh, millicurie doses uh, actually worked quite well. Now, um, we, we then went on to sort of first look at um, external beam radiation, um, so that's 20 grade uh, given to um, a uh, mouse xenograft model with skid mice, and here again we saw that the survival is significantly longer. We give the fulvestrant every other day, so three days a week. It's a sub-Q injection um, of um, uh, five milligrams, um, and you could also see on the right-hand side that uh, the tumor necrosis was uh, larger in the Ki-67, uh, lower in those tumors that received uh, fulvestrant. Now, we do have a mouse model that's based on um, uh, a xenograft model, but that's also based on uh, having these cells transfected with uh, BLI, which helps a little bit because you don't have to always uh, do uh, specs. I'm not going to talk to you about this right now, but just to show you that um, actually when we give our mice with QGP1 um, SSTR2 Luthithera, we do see a nice uptake uh, there. Uh, that seems to work the best within the first week, so I think there's not a lot of preclinical data on mice getting uh, Luthithera, but we do think that uh, the first week is, is uh, when it works best. This experiment is really um, in progress right now, so it's giving Luthithera to our mice with fulvestrin. So I could show you some preliminary data here. This is some um, uh, spec four hours um, after. Um, I don't know what happened. The technical difficulties. I didn't. I promise I didn't push on anything. But uh, we gave um, we gave our mice fulvestrin four hours. Um, excuse me, for Western and Luthothera, and we measured um, um, the uh, Luthothera uptake through SPECT, um, and we saw that there was obviously really great um, uptake the same day, but uh, as far out as five days after we have actually given them the uh, Luthothera. So, so there was some Luthothera left uh, in, thank you very much, in the... Uh, like tumors at five days, so probably seven days we're going to look at uh, next time is the maximum type, time point. This is preliminary data. Again, we started this experiment literally 12 days ago, but you can see already the green curve starts to split away from the uh, uh, like purple curve, which shows that uh, the green curve is the combined uh, Luthothera plus fulvestrin compared to Luthothera alone. So we'll follow these mice and we'll see what that shows, but it will probably show something very similar to the external beam radiation. Now, of course, science is complicated, especially for surgeons. And the truth is that we were hoping, okay, great, this all makes super sense. You know, we're going to stain our samples and we're going to figure out whether there is um, estrogen uh, receptor um, alpha in our cells. And similar to what has actually been published before, only a very small amount of these uh, samples had um, estrogen receptors, um, 66, which is sort of the standard uh, form. Um, and when we looked at our cell line, it wasn't present. So now we're scratching our head because we have fulvestrin that we think really sensitizes these cells, but we don't know how it's doing it because you assume that there would be some form of fulvestrin, uh, 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 excuse me, um, estrogen receptor present, right? So there is actually a, there are several uh, variants of the um, isoform of this uh, receptor, and specifically the 36 one is the one that's been associated a lot with cancer progression because it activates the PI3K um, AKT pathway, which is something that we all know is very active in neuroendocrine tumors in general. And lo and behold, when we start looking for that variant, there's not a lot of um, antibodies out there that work well for that subvariant, but we do see that uh, our cell lines have these uh, variant. And I'm, uh, I'm going to skip through this because we don't have time. But essentially, uh, remember that uh, the subvariant um, activates the PI3K AKT pathway. So when we give icaritine, which is supposed to actually degrade the estrogen receptor 36 um, isoform to our cells, we actually see a decrease in phosphorylated ERK and a decrease in BRCA1. So we do think that this is probably a viable target. Um, we also see that if we give ourselves radiation, um, 
that subvariant um, actually um, increases. And so uh, we think that um, estrogen receptor 36 plays an important role in uh, DNA repair uh, post-radiation in neuroendocrine tumor cells. How that happens, we don't quite know, whether it's through the PI3K um, AKT pathway or through something else. We're still looking at that. Now, the second part, just for the next two, three minutes, uh, that we were looking at is how um, ATRA and PIN1 could potentially play an important role in radiosensitizing these tumors. And here we had a little bit better luck when we looked at our, um, at our uh, human uh, samples um, and our cell lines. We saw that there was a fair amount of PIN1 that was actually expressed, specifically in peanuts, small bowel nets, and lung nets. So if you see, uh, there's about uh, two-thirds of, uh, like, peanuts at least that have a um, um, high concentration of PIN1, so that makes it a pretty uh, straightforward target if we think about that. Uh, we did uh, clonogenic assays, and here again we saw that um, ATRA radio sensitizes. Similar in, uh, with our xenograph model, we haven't tried it yet with Luthothera. We still have to do that. But looking a little bit again into what um, ATRA does, one of the things that was really um, uh, sort of um, interesting to see is that ATRA uh, downregulates pain, but also, uh, especially when combined with radiation, downregulates. Um, ESR1 um, expression, and ESR1 uh, transcribes for both the 66 as well as the 36 uh, like kilodalton variants. So we think that there, again, may probably be some crosstalk between these two pathways. And again, you know, when we give um, ATRA, we do see a decrease in BRCA1 and BRCA2 messenger RNA. It's not as uh, significant, but we definitely see it. I'm going to skip that quickly. Um, and um, when we look at mechanistics um, explanations on how that works, you could see here that ATRA plus IR decreases PIN1 levels, which is expected. Um, ATRA, uh, when we stain for gamma H2AX, when combined with IR, especially at four hour um, after radiation, does significantly, significantly increase gamma um, H2AX on IF, so that uh, means much more DNA damage in the um, atra treated group. And lastly, when we actually look at um, BRCA1, you could see that uh, BRCA1 levels decrease. So they increase when you give radiation, which is expected, but then they decrease when you combine atra with uh, radiation. So that gives us a little bit of an idea of uh, at least one of the pathways uh, that this is probably working through, which is the lower end pathways. I think what we are still looking for here specifically is how does fulvestrin affect um, estrogen receptor alpha and specifically the 36 kilodalton variant, which we really um, uh, have just sort of started uh, to study. Um, is there some uh, like conformational changes PIN1 does specifically on this subvariant? We're still looking at that. And then lastly, um, how does this subvariant actually really affect DNA repair? Is it perhaps through the PI3K? Um, AKT pathway, we're not sure and we're studying this, but we did submit an IIT to start uh, like combining Fulvestrin with PRT because we think that we have enough uh, preclinical data to see if that's going to be something that, uh, that may work in our patient population. Sorry for the technical issues again. I do have to put that slide up. <laughs> yeah, thank you to everybody that's involved. No, that that was that was quite masterful the way you just handled uh, the way the entire group actually handled some irregular operations there. So nice work, everyone. We have enough time for I think just just a couple moments and more questions. Uh, oh, please, Rene. <laughs> Um, very interesting data. Um, just wanted to ask you uh, about the selectivity of the radio sensitization. This is always the hardcore of our um, strategies uh, since the, the times when we introduced capacitabine uh, uh, as a radio sensitizer for uh, PRRT. Now, have you measured the um, um, let's say organ damage or organ effect of the radio sensitization. Do you have uh, uh, gamma H two AX uh, assays to testify what what happens in the normal organs? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we actually have not because we just literally uh, are in the middle of the experiments. But it's part of the things that we are looking at um, in our mouse model. I can tell you that the mice do very well. So, you know, they don't lose weight, you know, if you combine it with fulvestrin. So that's, I think, a very good sign. 
However, uh, yeah, we have to look at that. You know, what, what, what we specifically wanted to look at is try to sort of think outside the box rather than sort of the standard, you know, like uh, chemotherapy regimen to use those as radiosensitizers because of the bone marrow sup uh, uh, suppression that they may have, as well as the uh, lutetium-177. We try to, th uh, to think of something that was a little bit more creative that perhaps is not going to have a lot of side effects. Fulvestrin is generally a very, very well like tolerated drugs if you give it to like patients, so they have very few side effects. So we hope, but we will study it further, uh, that that you know it's not going to have any major side effects. Yeah. Tito, why don't you go ahead, please? Yeah. Uh, so, what is the mechanism between fulvestrin and lutathera? We don't know for sure, but uh -huh. the, the, we think that fulvestrin actually uh, decreases the, the transcription of DNA repair genes, specifically uh -huh. homologous recombination DNA repair genes. So, you know, um, when, when we came out with this MEN1 paper, we figured, okay, well, that's great, but it really only affects about 50% of patients, right, that have a somatic uh, MEN1 mutations, and it's only like PNET patients. So we aim to look at something that's a little bit broader, and when you know, we did some research, we noticed that MEN1 actually binds together with estrogen receptor to transcribe this gene, so that's why we're targeting that, uh, you know, that receptor in particular. And since you couldn't find the conventional the 66 estrogen receptor, variant, yeah. yeah, so will that variant then be predictive of who responds and who doesn't? Do you need at least that variant to have the... Oh, we don't know yet. Yeah. Okay. We're still looking into this, yeah. But the 36 kilodalton variant is very common, actually, and it's specifically very commonly um, upregulated in a whole bunch of cancers, not just breast cancer. We have time for just one more. So oh, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask the uh, copper guys uh, a question here. The uh, difference, if you think there might be, between using the antagonist, which increases uptake in the tumor, and using the statins increasing up to uptake in the tumor, do you think these might be synergist synergistic, or do you think maybe the statins are increasing it to maybe the same level you're seeing with the antagonist? Well, it's a good question, but I just learned today that we can do that, so um, I need to think <laughs> of, uh, of this. Is, uh, but it's certain synergistic, yeah. I mean, it's, it's always when combining different drugs to see if this is a cumulative effect of one plus one makes two, or if it's, it's really synergistic. Um, this makes uh, a lot of more, a lot more complicated to understand exactly which mechanism I think also the work uh, from my previous uh, colleague there is, uh, is, is fantastic to, to dissect the mechanism where synergy can be expected, but um, happy to collaborate. <laughs> well, I was just curious because the, um, if the statins increase the expression of the receptor, that's different, but it maybe changes the state from the antagonist to the agonist, or vice versa. So it increases availability versus increasing expression. Yeah. So uh, on that note, uh, magically, we have finished precisely on time, everyone. Uh, and I just, I do just want to take a moment to point out that actually right there, we just saw the magic of this meeting, right? Like the, the, the synergy of the interaction between the presenters and the audience in this setting, that is what makes this meeting, I think, the best meeting to come to every year. And no better, better note to end on and go off to lunch. So please go enjoy. We will see everyone back for the group th photo at 1.30. Uh, which is on everyone's agenda. Thanks again. <laughs>